Triceratops are known for their namesake three-horned skull. Over the 131 years since its discovery, there have been a buttload of specimens of this celebrated ceratopsian uncovered. So many Triceratops skulls have been found that each one provides a special look at unique individuals which went through many ordeals during their lives. One of the most unusual specimens boasts the largest pair of brow horns ever recorded on a Triceratops, Yoshi's Trike. Most of the time, when a complete or nearly complete fossil specimen is uncovered from the depths of the earth, the team which did the hard work of excavating the fossils names it. This happens quite often, but not all the time of course. For instance, many Tyrannosaur skeletons have been given names, as they are relatively rare. You've got the infamous Sue, as well as poor Stan, the Bunker Buster Scotty, Black Beauty from Canada, and more. Since two-legged meat-eaters are the most charismatic to us two-legged omnivorous meat-eaters, theropods get named the most frequently. There have been some very minor criticisms of naming fossil specimens in the past. Those that oppose the naming of specimens have said that it anthropomorphizes these animals too much. Naming extinct specimens is likened to people unfairly anthropomorphizing living animals, which we know can be quite dangerous. Sean, hit your cigar. It may also create a mythical atmosphere surrounding extinct critters. They may be no longer seen as species of animals that moved around and did boring animal things, but rather as mythical figures that made achievements, thought far beyond the capabilities of their brains, and teamed up with raptors to fight monstrous hybrids. I find it all to be a load of horseshit, to be honest. Is it true that a lot of people anthropomorphize things to an unhealthy level? Yeah, definitely. Are all of the possible side effects of anthropomorphizing fossil specimens true as well? Yeah, probably. Should that mean we put an end to naming fossil specimens? No, I don't think so. Giving a personal nickname to a fossil specimen provides a lot of potential for science outreach. It bridges the gap between museum visitors and a fossil collection's old dusty cabinets. It can create a level of empathy in the public that fosters the need to protect fossil resources. It's much easier to empathize with a fossil specimen when it's given a nickname and slightly anthropomorphized. No one cares if specimen AMNH5632 is moved, destroyed, or sold. But I bet we'd all start to care a bit more about Sue, Scotty, Fran, or Big Al being placed atop the anti-intellectual chopping block. It surprisingly doesn't harm our understanding of extinct organisms if we anthropomorphize them too. They're dead. Very, very dead. I don't think we have to worry about some idiot trying to get too close to a Tyrannosaurus because they think they're cute and cuddly because of viral videos. Anthropomorphizing fossil specimens might harm the attempt to uphold a level of objectivity in paleontology. But so long as the folks involved with the science-y side of paleontology can detach themselves from their specimens when it's important, I, I see this as an absolute win. With that off my chest, we can now get into the story of Yoshi's Trike. During a 2010 field expedition to the Badlands of Montana, a team of paleontologists from the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana, uncovered a Triceratops. The field crew were joined by Dr. Yoshihiro Katsura, of the Gifu Prefectural Museum in Japan. Dr. Katsura was the guy who first found the Triceratops sticking out of the ground. It initially didn't seem like a promising specimen or dig site, but Hell Creek expert Dr. Denver Fowler made the call to initiate excavation. What was originally a few scrappy bits of skull turned into a really decent noggin. Dr. Katsura's skull eventually led to the discovery of the rest of the skeleton of what would turn out to be a moderately complete triceratops of moderate size. The excavation started almost immediately and took a total of two weeks to get the skull out. More crew members were obtained and the rest of the skeleton was excavated in 2011 over the course of a month. According to Dr. Fowler, who was especially helpful in making this video, the excavation was a grueling task. It took all summer to get the skeleton out. 
There was a lot of overburden atop the bones which had to be taken off to get the bones jacketed and out of the field. There were large connected pieces, as well as smaller floaty bits, so all sizes of protective jackets had to be made to save the bones. The jackets were made of plaster-soaked burlap, layered atop one another until the whole package could be broken from the rock underneath it. After that, the bones were completely jacketed and more burlap, until they were a bunch of big white lumps of rock and bone. The big pieces had to be reinforced with lumber. The small jackets were transported with ATVs, and larger jackets were taken by helicopter to a flatbed trailer. All of the specimens were transported back to the museum within a day once all of the tough work had been completed. Once back at the museum, the bones were carefully deburlapped. One dedicated fossil preparator took about six months to peel the burlap from the fossils, chunk off the rock, and clean the bones of their matrix. Once everything was cleaned and logged into the collections at the museum, scientific artist Nat Smith was contacted to help create a mount to display the new specimen. It was given the name Yoshi's Trike after Dr. Katsura. The skeletal mount display was constructed by molding and casting the original fossils in presumably resin or similar plastic material. The original bones were preserved in a fine mudstone which made them quite fragile and unfit for display. The missing bones were sculpted based on the law of symmetry and based on other, more complete Triceratops specimens. These were then molded and cast in the same material as the original fossils, and all of the casts were then mounted on a steel structure. The bones which were found were painted, while the missing bones were kept white to show the museum visitors what's what. This process took an additional nine months. Those who worked on the excavation, including then PhD student Denver Fowler, and of course, Dr. Yoshihiro Katsura, knew this Triceratops was special. It wasn't until the thing was taken back and prepared that exactly how and why it was weird would be figured out. Turns out, Yoshi's trike has the largest recorded pair of brow horns on any Triceratops yet discovered. They measure about 1.15 meters, or 3.77 feet. The weird thing about that is Yoshi's trike is a sub-adult of average size. It was not an enormous fully grown 9 meter 9 ton behemoth. It's a big boy, sure, but not as big or as old as they've been known to get. Based on photos of the specimen, Yoshi reaches about 20-ish feet long, 6 meters. He's probably a little longer though. At that size, he may have weighed in as much as 5 or 6 tons and stands about 8-ish feet, 2.4 meters tall. Looking at Yoshi's skeleton makes me think he's been reconstructed with an overly arched spine. The vast majority of dinosaurs are usually reconstructed with a moderately arched spine, but this guy almost has a hump. I don't want to be too critical of the guy who molded the bones or the team that put it together, but it does seem somewhat off compared to other Triceratops mounts and even the baby it's displayed with. I'm no Triceratops expert, nor a Ceratopsian expert, so I can't personally say for sure what's going on, so I'll leave it at that. By themselves, the horns aren't that bizarre, but when you see them attached to a medium-sized trike skull in person, it really puts the longhorn cattle-like look of the beast into perspective. The long brow horns weren't really much of a surprise. They were observed to be of unusual size in the field. In fact, they were so large that they were originally thought to be part of the femur. Yoshi, as I'll take to calling it from now on, is considered a subadult animal. It's currently being worked on by Dr. John Scanella, another Triceratops expert. Since well-known dinosaur bone cutter and egg breaker Dr. Jack Horner was the head guy at the Museum of the Rockies at the time of Yoshi's excavation, Dr. Katsura wanted to get the rest of the body once it was confirmed to be at the site. This would allow some histology studies to be done on the beast. Histology is just studying the microanatomy of organisms. When it comes to dinosaurs, that usually includes cutting through bones and mounting them on a microscope slide to see what kind of information was preserved. This important info can include blood vessels, parasites, signs of growth, age, and much more. Yoshi is important to the study of Triceratops evolution due to exactly what layer of rock it was lodged in. Yoshi was excavated out of the middle Hell Creek formation. 
The layer of rock two meters above poor Yoshi has been dated at about 66.3 million years. This makes Yoshi part of the transition in Triceratops from one older type from 66.8 million years ago to a younger type at 66 million years. Of course, before they all got wiped the hell off the face of the planet. This might explain its weird horns. Older trikes from lower layers of the Hell Creek formation tend to have smaller nose and brow horns. Many of these Triceratops can be assigned to the species Triceratops horridus. Trikes found near the top of the Hell Creek tend to have smaller brow horns that bend forward and much larger nose horns. These Triceratops can usually be assigned to the species Triceratops prorsus. Those in the middle should, and do, have a mix of traits between the two, as one species changed into another over the course of 1.5 million years. Something weird like Yoshi fits with what one would expect of Triceratops evolution, based on known trends, as it had a longer nose horn and enormous brow horns. Yoshi used these traits to face many dangers in his Hell Creek home. Yoshi, like most Triceratops to ever live, had to face a bunch of nasty obstacles in its habitat. The biggest predator Yoshi may have had to deal with was Tyrannosaurus. When he was younger, Yoshi may have also defended himself from the raptorial arms and sharp intelligence of the Dromaeosaurs Achaeoraptor and Dakotoraptor. Dakotoraptor could have grown to around 18 feet 5.5 meters which would have made them formidable dangers to Yoshi, even at the size he was at death. It's currently unknown if Yoshi's remains preserve evidence of how he died, but it's certainly possible it was a predator like Dakotoraptor or Tyrannosaurus. Yoshi may have been better equipped to fight or scare off these predators due to his large horns, but it's possible his horns may have been even bigger when he was alive. The horns of Triceratops were ever-growing things, as the animal aged, the horns got bigger and longer. The horns you see on the fossils were just the bony inner core. When they were alive, a sheath of keratin covered it. This means the exact size and shape of the horns when Triceratops were alive is unknown, but they would certainly have been larger than the bone cores. Dr. Mark Witten has hypothesized that one can predict the horn shape based on the underlying bone shape. Since the horns of Triceratops changed heavily as they aged, with juvenile animals bearing backwards curving horns, and the base of the adult horn bent forward, the shape of the keratin sheath which covered the bony cores could have been quite curvy. They started out curved, and then that curved sheath was bent forward by the morphing of the horns as the animals aged. If we take this general idea further, Yoshi's horns may have been both longer and curvier than the fossils immediately suggest. This reconstruction by paleoartist King Rexy provides a good idea of a possible curviness profile for Yoshi's big honkin' horns. King Rexy also took the liberty of adding some ibex-inspired ridges and notches to the horns to make them more interesting, but that's not inferred from the bones. There's a lot to love about this specimen and its mount. The specimen and its mount on display at the Museum of the Rockies has proved so famous and funky that the research group, book publisher, and science model company, Eofauna, have reproduced Yoshi in toy form. I no longer collect dinosaur toys, models, or figures as I once did as a kid, but Eofauna's models are so well made and well researched that I might just have to change that. I'd personally be ecstatic if a dinosaur I found was turned into a toy. What do you think about Yoshi? I think a film needs to be made about just this fella. What kind of struggles would you have him face in your own story about the beast? What other weird mutations could have occurred? Let me know in the comments below, and thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video and share it around. Leave a comment if you like and subscribe. Hit the bell icon too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Pledge to my Patreon at any tier you like for a slew of many delicious offerings. Special thanks to patrons Dinosaur, Natty Cat, Ed Peretz, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, Dana Manchester, Aphid Kirby, Chris Frampton, and Andrew.